that's that's one of the challenges. So sometimes you are so pumped up and you want to go straight in that you forgot to take even the basic preparations. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Chumati, for the, those kind words. And I would like to thank Santa, a very good friend of mine. Is uh, one, uh, she's someone that I came to know, even though she's from a neighboring state. We never meet in the Nordics, but it's through the NCCI, Isha NCCI, that I've come to know Santa. And she's such a beautiful person outside and inside as well. And I'd like to thank the others, all the participants, for this opportunity. Um, can I share the screen? Uh, would like to share the screen with you. Yeah, yeah. John, sir, I'm making you a co-host. Then you can share your screen. Okay. All right. Yeah. You are so a co-host, sir, now. Waiting for. All right. Thank you very much. So, yeah, I hope it's, you can see it. You can see my screen now. <clears throat> Is my voice clear, by the way? Actually, some windy sound is there, sir, at the background. Okay. But almost clear, yeah. but almost clear. Yeah. All right. How is it now? Yeah, loud and clear now. Yeah. All right. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so, yeah, today we are continuing with our workshop. It's not a seminar. It's not a lecture series, but a workshop. I think that much we have to be very clear. Even though it's online, we are not together in the same room or in the same premises, but we are participating in a workshop. So we are trying to, we'll try our best to facilitate the immediate participation and engagement of the participants with the subject matter. And we will be looking at, today and tomorrow, we'll be looking at human sexuality and gender diversity in our churches and traditions. From, so it's pers this uh, perspective from the churches and the traditions. And oh, before I forget, I would like also like to thank the Judy and the, those who led us in the devotion. It was a beautiful and very meaningful devotion that we've had, um, especially learning, looking at that Old Testament, the Psalm, and uh, it's always very interesting how the Psalms has to say to us, to our struggles, to our life, to our experiences. We tend to think that these are only just beautiful songs, beautiful poetry, but in, beyond the beauty of it, there is so much meaning, so much uh, meaningful message that can be taken out of it. So um, even though it's not possible, I would like to start on a premise that we'll try to put behind, leave behind much of the prejudices and the preconceived notions that we have had. So. Um, I'm interested in trying as best as we can to start from a blank slate. Uh, in, in philosophy, they often talk of this tabula rasa. I don't know whether that, there are proponents of it. There are opponents of it as well, that the mind, we are born without any innate knowledge. But whether that's true or whether that's correct, accurate or not, I would like to at least invite you to start to a certain extent with a blank slate as much as possible. And Yesterday, I came across a very interesting photo on, this, on social media. And this is, uh, I've cropped this. Uh, this is not a full image, but uh, it, here in, in the image on the left, you can see one dog looking at the computer screen, uh, a bunch of sheep, or rather a herd of sheep coming close to the dog. Now the dog is uh, most probably from all its, from appearances and looks, looks to be a border collie, belongs to a breed that is used for herding, especially sheep. So in a sense, he can also be called a shepherd as we in our respective ways are followers of the good shepherd. We also try our best to be good shepherds ourselves. But um, when we look at the fuller picture, because the picture can be interpreted in so many different ways, but when we look at the picture, uh, the fuller picture as it was interpreted and conveyed by the person who made it. Then we come to know that this dog is a name Wilson, whether that's the real name or not, doesn't matter. But it's also uh, working from home. 
and this is what the challenge and the condition the situation that we find ourselves in these days because of this covid most if not all of us are working from home having to do having uh, having to make do the best we can with all this technology with all this uh, it tools and devices and gadgets at our disposal trying to make the best of it and then on the other hand we as shepherds also have a responsibility we have our sheep we have our people we have our students we have our church members we have our community members looking towards coming to us for guidance for expectation and this um it's a i find it a very good representation of that and sometimes yeah when we analyze humor we, when we analyze jokes too much it they lose their punch they lose their veracity they lose their meaning but uh, i would like to start on this with this today's presentation today's session with this because uh, we are in a in some way or rather we have so much in common with wilson the border collie who has to do work from home and to whom uh, many are looking for for leadership many sheep are looking for leadership and guidance um so jokes sexism and disparagement humor uh, I, first thing is uh, that's what i'd like to look at i already mentioned when we analyze jokes too much they lose their favor they lose their flavor they lose their punch but still it's important because jokes also re sometimes reflect uh, our deeper feelings even though we might claim that we've said or done something in this jokingly we don't not serious but then it can also be a reflection of what we have uh, deep down inside so for instance there is this one joke what do you do when the dishwasher stops working you hit her it's a very indian um, solution to a problem when the tv does not work you hit it a little bit when the radio earlier when the radio doesn't work you hit it a little bit and then it sometimes it works again or almost any kind of machine it's not only about i mean we don't often are bothered about dismantling it looking at the nitty gritties of it but rather just tap it a little hard or hit it and then it starts working but then here also the joke it's it's a it's a very sinister very disparaging humor hidden here because there is a play on the word dishwasher what, what because dishwasher in the english language it is an it right it's a neuter gender but then and you you look at that answer the response and her it sort of suggests that okay this is a play on uh, words to a certain extent but it also has shows an attitude or attitude or a response or rather a feeling towards or seeing the wife seeing the mother seeing the woman seeing the female member of the household as a dishwasher so it, jokes don't come often don't always come in a, from a vacuum because uh, sometimes it can be very sexist sometimes it can be very racist so all of this together are cl to get clubbed as disparagement humor now we are looking into all this because um we're dealing a lot with words even santa was asking us to look anew at what the word unique means and likewise it, it's important that we understand what we talk about it's important that we don't make the same mistakes that we've been making or the, we don't keep using the same loaded statements the same loaded terminologies and concept so disparagement humor is uh, any kind of humor that belittles stereotypes or maligns an individual or social group so these are jokes that employ sexist homophobic transphobic or racist humor and they rely this disparagement humor or the jokes disparaging jokes rely on the implicit assumptions that the people who are listening to the joke will recognize the stereotypes that form the premise for the joke so the the premise or the premise uh, there are certain stereotypes that we build around almost 
every people or every community around us. So we'll have all those Sardar jokes, for instance. We'll have all those Malu jokes. Even the using of the word Malu, it can be a very disparaging terminology. So likewise, even in our own Northeastern communities where I come from, for instance, we have so many jokes about the neighbor. We have so many jokes about the neighboring community, the neighboring tribe. And sometimes these are repeated, maybe with the feeling that they are harmless, but then they can be very disparaging because hate, um, humor and hatred also sometimes often, or rather very often go together, especially when you look at this kind of disparagement humor. And so this, the dishwasher terminology or the dishwasher joke was a misogyny cloaked in humor because we know what misogyny is. Misogyny it is often understood as hatred of or aversion to or prejudice against women or girls. And it refers to behavior, conditions, or attitudes that foster stereotypes of social based on sex. And it is a working women at a lower status than men. So misogyny, it's a, often employed for keeping women in their place, as it is often And then closely related to misogyny is this term sexism, the ideology based on the belief that one sex is superior to another. It is discrimination, prejudice, or stereotyping based on gender very often. And it's often, most often expressed toward women and girls. Now we are looking at all this because um, even the homophobia, the transphobia that we have, that we are struggling with, and which we are trying to dismantle here through our participation and our engagement in this and isha and cci it has a lot to do with sexism it has its roots it has it is grounded in sexist in our misogynistic in our sexist belief and that's what at least i believe in of course it's not only one way there is a term called misandry which is the dislike of or the contempt for or the ingrained prejudice against men that is the male sex but now we are not going to deal too much with misandry because we are dealing with history and the traditions, the churches and the, the, the traditions of the churches. And I don't, as far as I know, there is no church community where there is widespread misandry, where there is widespread dislike of or contempt for or the ingrained prejudice against men. So at least in various quarters, we have so much of misogyny or misogynistic practices, even though it might be jokes. Now I did not introduce myself properly. I come from Mizoram. And of course, from 94 onwards, I've been engaged. That, that was the year I joined theological education. So my engagement with the church is also quite limited. I know only pastors and future pastors who come to study in the church. I don't, of course, I go to church, but then not in a, I don't have any leadership role in the church. So the, the main engagement I have with church people, church leaders, has to do with the engagements that I have in theological colleges and campuses. And I've been, I don't know whether I should, be, I should consider myself lucky or unlucky. When I started counting, I realized that recently I counted uh, when, that I've spent at least one semester or more, either as a student or a teacher, in eight theological colleges under the Senate of Serampur College. I started out in Shillong, the John Roberts Theological Seminary, and then continued in Aizol, my hometown, and then Kolkata here, Bishops, then UTC, Bangalore, worked in Leonard, Jabalpur, uh, took up some doctorate program in Gurukul, and then left it for some time to put it on hold and then stayed with my family in Madurai. My wife was doing her doctoral studies there and then came back to Leonard, resumed my doctoral studies. Was set, I was sent to UBS Pune for, for uh, one year uh, my, because my guide was there and I was sent. So I stayed there on campus one year and then after that I went off and on. So, and then after that, 
Kenji. So I realized that, uh, yeah, my dealings with the church and church people, apart from the congregation members, are mostly to do with teachers, other theological college, other theological teachers, as well as pastors and future pastors who have come to the college as more studies. But in all this, what I've realized is that there is hardly any misandry to speak of. The church, I have not experienced, I have not seen, I have not noticed any misandry or a widespread kind of thing because women are not in the driver's seat. <clears throat> but then I've seen quite a few, quite a lot of misogyny. So that's why I'm very concerned. And I believe that unless and until we start at trying to uproot this misogyny that is so deeply entwined with the life and witness of the church, with the life of the church and has blighted its witness. Our fight or our struggle against homophobia and transphobia also will be very limited and it might not be as successful as might not be as fruitful as we would like it to be. And so um, my I start on the premise that misogyny is closely related or rather a close fact, uh, a very important factor, a very big influence behind the homophobia and the transphobia that we have. And then our homophobia and our transphobia is also uh, sort of impacts on the misogyny, the misogynistic practices that we have in our churches again and again. Because misandry, as I said, I've not really noticed it. It may be mass manifested in numerous ways, <clears throat> such as social exclusion, sexism, hostility, genocentrism, mockery, belittling of men, violence against men, and sexual objectification. But now, if we look at this, the various manifestations of misandry as highlighted here, apart from that genocentrism, I believe that Indian women, Indian Christian women, or a large part, portion of a large segment of Indian Christian women have faced all this except for this genocentrism. Social exclusion, sexism, hostility, mockery, belittling of, oh, okay, that's also another, belittling of women. Okay, you change that. And then violence against women and then sexual objectification itself. So this is, it is very essential. It is very vital that we understand this nature, this lopsided nature of uh, the church and the kind of discrimination, the discriminatory practices that we have in our churches. And like I said, misogyny often translates or often leads or is a very big factor behind the homophobia and the transphobia that we have. Because when we think of homophobia or, or rather when we think of um, homosexuals, when we think of members of the LGBTIQA plus community, very often, what we think of straight away is the caricature of the gay, the male homosexual. And later we start branching out or start adding the other into it, even though in that alphabet soup that we have, the L comes first, but usually when we think of members of this community, the first and foremost, and which we are most strongly against or which the church people are often up in arms strongly against is the male homosexual so the gay community so uh, it is important to recognize this and to understand that this is these are corollaries and we have to understand also who, how we have come to this state of affairs church history and the contribution of the church fathers and other father figures that we have in our churches are very play a very big role in post, in our fostering such attitude very recently a friend of mine who is um, a scholar uh, a literature man his, his basic expertise is in english literature but he has done a lot of work in Mizo literature as well. That is my community. And what he had unearthed recently was that during the colonial era, there was a prohibition order that was issued by the superintendent of the Lushai Hills, as Mizoram was known at the time. Now, um, many of you might not know it. 
because even though we often speak of colonial era, the British Empire and British India and so on, it was actually a patchwork. British India was a patchwork of so many administrative units. And one of the units was this, uh, the hill tribe community, uh, the hill tribe districts or the hill districts in Northeast, which were for the most part considered excluded areas, excluded in the sense that they were not really part of, considered part of the direct administrate. They do not come under the direct administrative relevance or purview of the state governments. For instance, Assam did not really have any role in that. So the Lushai Hills, the Naga Hills, and then the <coughs> North Kachar Hills. And then various other, these were called excluded. And then there were others that were called partially excluded. But the point here is in those areas, it was the political agent of the British Empire, which, who was considered the supreme authority, who doesn't have, who can rule or who rules as, and who, as he likes. So to speak. So that superintendent in my own place issued a warning or rather a prohibition against what we call the Tuai Kopang. Tuai Kopang uh, basically translates to male gays, a group of gays who go around from town to town or village to village. Um, it is something that is hushed up, but then I realized that we realized rather that if the political authority put up or issued this kind of prohibition, then that means it must have been a very kind of a rampant practice. It was a very prevalent practice. So those gay male homosexuals going around from place to place, maybe giving out favors or maybe earning, we don't know exactly because it is not, uh, the literature is very scanty on that. But then the point here is it was there to a certain extent, but then with the coming of the colonial power, because there was this imposition, which we keep seeing again and again, that the Victorian morality, as we often talk about, that, that also played the big role in how governance worked in the government, the colonial government also worked. And only recently we have come out from the, the yoke, come out from under the yoke of section 377, for instance, if we look at India as a whole. So, the, it is very important to look at that. But then the church history, we have to understand the church history. We have to look at, this, to look at the contribution of the church fathers and other father figures towards fostering the attitudes that we've had, this very intense dislike or hatred of uh, members of the sexual minority groups. Because we have to agree that the church is hierarchical and totalitarian to a degree. But first, we have to let, we'll just look at the biblical basis for this, for the homophobia or the transphobia and even the misogyny that we have. Um, so where does it come from? So there are three major influences upon the life of the church, upon the nature of the church, the church that, the nature of the church that has, that was gradually formed and shaped but we're looking at the early church here right now. So this is the Jewish influence or the Jewish cultural influence, the Roman culture, and then the Greek. Apart from this, the words of Jesus that we see recorded in the Christian scriptures were not very considered very important. Even now, if you really analyze the attitude we have or many of the arguments that we have against members of this LGBTIQA plus communities, you'll, you'll find that most people will go straight to the Old Testament. So a selective literalism is often at work here in our interpretation, in our understanding of um, the Bible and in its role and its implementation in our li the, in the lives of the, in the, of the faith community as well. So Jesus seems to have said very, very little about sex. And his recorded words are contradictory. Now, I use this word, recorded words, this term, recorded words in a very loose sense because we are not too sure if 
the material recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are exactly as Jesus voiced them, or even exactly as they happen. So I'm using this term, recorded word, very loosely. And whatever it is, the recorded words of Jesus in the Bible seem to be contradictory sometimes. And of course, they are not necessarily an accurate depiction of his attitude or understanding. They do not give a, an, an, the, under, the understanding of Jesus in its entirety. But they are all that we have to move on. So we have to, we cannot ignore it. So first and foremost, let's acknowledge that Jesus said, Jesus declared that marriage is ordained by God in Matthew 19, 4 to 5. And marriage here, naturally, we're talking of a, what may be called a heterosexual, heterosexual marriage. Not a same-sex marriage, but marriage between men and women. So sometimes the logic that we often apply is that if Jesus said that marriage is ordained by God, then okay, marriage between one man, one woman is the only thing that is ordained by God. So that's, okay, we'll leave it at that. But that's the, often the conclusion that we, used to, we, we draw. So um, when we look at the attitude of Jesus on sexuality and marriage, he also appears to approve of those who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Now, what Santa raised earlier was very, is very important because when Jesus said eunuchs, people who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Yes, um, okay, maybe this is a good idea because Victor, Victor Moses has raised a hand. Before we, we this is a workshop, so we, we will give him time to raise uh, comment, make a comment or a question. Yes, Victor. Sorry, sorry, it was by mistake. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm actually Anyhow, sorry. No, it's a good I, I mistake. No, it's a good mistake that you made. Don't feel sorry <laughs> because I should have no, I should have mentioned it at the beginning rather than me giving a lecture going on and making everyone feel sleepy. It's good if you raise your hands, if you raise points, questions, or comments also in, in the middle of my presentation. Because um, rather than that banking model of education, right? Me being the big lecturer, <laughs> giving you information and filling your head with so, a lot of information, it's, it's better that uh, we engage in the meeting itself as part of the lecture uh, or as part of the workshop. So if you have anything to raise, if you have anything, if you have any point to make, or if you have any doubts to clarify, please raise your hand. And then we'll try to work through this because I don't claim to have any expertise on this matter. It's something that I've been studying, that is something that I've been engaging, but engaging with. But every day I learn something new. So it's good. It's a good mistake that you made, Victor, so don't feel bad. Now, uh, let me continue then, if there is no <clears throat> thing. So Jesus also characterizes the unmarried as equal to angels and sons of the resurrection. So it seems, uh, okay, on the one hand, he, say, he seems to condone marriage or in, 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 in effect, he may seem to glorify marriage. But then on the other, he, have, he has also praised for these people who have made themselves eunuchs or who people who have remained unmarried. Now, like I was saying, people who have made themselves eunuchs, what does Jesus really mean when he speaks of eunuchs here? He was, was he speaking of those, only the, the, the people who have been uh, sexually, males who have been sexually castrated or males who have been rendered important through various means? Or is it, is he using it or a wider, or is he using it for a larger community? Or we have to think of all this because Jesus also, Jesus is, was also God, but he was also human. And he was working and living, ministering in a particular social mile. So the understanding that was there, 
I don't believe, we, we have no reason to believe that he would go straight uh, very far away from the socio-cultural milieu that he was operating with, but rather we often praise him for the usage of his parables, for usage of the similes and metaphors that he employs, which he drew from directly from the life and witness and the experiences of the of his audience. So when he speaks of eunuchs also, or speak of people who making themselves eunuchs, or even when the Bible speaks of eunuchs, is it to be limited only to that particular community or that, that group of people, or is it a wider, does it have wider connotations? These are things that we have to ask and we have to entertain as well. And so um, Jesus, at least we know that he clearly opposes adultery and divorce, and he seems to condemn sex with prostitutes because he believes that maybe, or just like we do, that sex and sexuality, sexual relations should be within the institution of marriage only, or doesn't believe in extramarital relationship. But yet he made friends with individual prostitutes, that much we know, because uh, he even shocked the priest who challenged him by commenting them, commenting that repentant prostitutes would get into heaven before these priests, the scribes and the Pharisees entered. So Jesus, this much we know about uh, Jesus and his attitude towards sexuality and marriage. So it's a bit contradictory. We don't, we are not really sure, but then at least we know that he was not very strong. He does not strongly advocate the homophobia and the transphobia that we, some of us seem to believe is the only correct way of looking at or entertaining this, the issues that we have around the sexual minorities. Ne next, we'll look at the centrality of Paul on the anti-roots of our attitude towards sexuality and gender diversities. Because Paul, as we all know, is much more central to most of our thinking about Jesus's message than Jesus himself. If you look at, when we look at the New Testament itself, we notice that a large portion of it is Paul. And then added to that, the other, there are quite a few books which may be considered to belong to the Pauline group or the Pauline community or people who share the same sentiments or ideological and theological beliefs with Paul and the Pauline community. So for the anti roots of Christian ideas about sex, the letters of Paul and those which are attributed to Paul are more important than the Gospels. Here we speak of them as being more important because these are the ones that we draw our ideas from. We don't have much to draw from the Gospels. But the letters of Paul and those that are attributed to Paul play a very big role in our Christian ideas about sex added to the Levitic book of Leviticus. So Paul expected Jesus to return very soon and maybe because of that, he regarded sex as one of the earthly concerns that should, Christians should not give importance to. That Christians should not give importance to many of these earthly concerns, including sex because Jesus is going to return very soon and we should only think of heavenly things, heavenly matters. To him, the virgin life was best. Of course, they can marry. They should marry if they, are, they, if they have very weak willpower and they cannot exercise self-control properly, then they should marry. That's what he said. But then uh, there is this very infamous list that we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Um, which is a list of people who he, he, which he declared would not enter heaven. And it, it has a strong close parallels with First Timothy chapter 1. So in that Paul opposed divorce and even suggested that widows and widowers would be happier if they did not remarry. So he was not very much in favor of marriage at this stage in his life when he was writing that. He condemned all extramarital sex he even singled out adulterers and masturbators along with thieves and drunkards as people who were unworthy of heaven. So this is what 
could say that in payments list, so to speak. First Corinthians chapter six verse nine, and this is um, in this passage. He spoke very strongly against Malakoi, the plural form of Malakos, and then another term, Arsenokoitai, the plural form of the word Arsenokoites. And he spoke of this Arsenokoitai in First Timothy also. So these three instances provides ammunition for mistranslations, sometimes mis deliberate mistranslations, which um, we will try to look at tomorrow. Because um, we will look at the word homosexual and the word how it has been abused, how it has been misused, and so on tomorrow, and how it has affected our translation process, Bible translation. Because the Bible, as we all know, is basically Greek, Koine Greek, and Hebrew, biblical Hebrew, along with a little bit of Aramaic. That's all. So um, the translation process is also a very, very interesting uh, subject and something which we have to give close attention to because very often things are lost in translation. But then there are various other matters which are added, baggage, which are added during the translation process as well. So this um, falls statements against the word malakoi and the term arsenokoitai these are often used as used by people to say that okay paul is against homosexuals paul is against gays but then we don't really know what he was talking to just like we don't really we're not really sure what jesus meant when he spoke of eunuchs we are not really sure when what paul Paul meant when he spoke of Malakoi and the Arsenokoi type, especially this word Arsenokoi type, because um, if you do a word study of this, Paul, it seems, was the first person to use this term. It seems to be a term that he has coined. It seems to be a term that he has created. And so it's very difficult, or rather, it's impossible at this stage. To speak exactly of, to speak of what Paul meant when exactly meant when he used this term as well. Uh, I will share uh, with you uh, one small paper. There are a lot of books. There are there's a lot of uh, literature on this as well. But then there is a small paper, uh, only around twenty pages or so, which I believe has done a very good job of uh, collating this information, collating the information as well as the translation, as well as the struggles or rather the misuse and abuse of these terms and these concepts. So uh, uh, it's something that I got from the internet. So I believe I'm, it's okay to freely share it. Um, it's freely available. So I will share the paper with you also, maybe through Jyoti, or I don't know if it's possible to share through this group chat or something. And then, um, so we'll, before we move on to these early Christian ideas, or rather the church, the church's ideas on sex, is there anything that we would like to raise or any points that we would like to make? Any clarifications that is needed? John, there is one question in the chat box raised by William Charles. Does yeah. the fear of fear or hatred insisted by the biblical others or historians? Biblical others, historians. Oh, yeah. See, what historians do is, or at least uh, me, I, as a student of history, what I do is I look at contemporary reality, contemporary situation. And then I also look at what uh, has happened in the church, what has happened in the past, what the church has thought or what church leaders as well as theologians have been teaching or doing. And then I try to understand how this 
present understanding or present concept or present situation has come to be through the various factors that could have contributed to it. For instance, um, to give you an example, the, this term that we often use, liberation theology. If we, if we were to study how liberation the theology has evolved or has come about as a particular stream or strand of doing theology within the wider uh, contextual theology, theological formulations, then you have to locate it within its mile. Where does it come from? Who are the people who first started speaking of this, the theology of liberation? or the liberation of theology and so on, those literature, all those literature. And then you have to look at where they, what situation they have come from, what kind of context they have arising and what context they are addressing. Likewise, um, the feeling or the attitude that we have in the church, it's not so much historians. Historians have hardly any role, so to speak, because even now, the limitation or rather the impact that I can have as a student of history is very limited. What I can do is I can point out to you or at least to the participants here today, how even then I have to pick and choose, right? I have, because I cannot go through with all of the writings of John Chrysostom with you, for instance. I cannot go through all the writings of Tertullian or Augustine, for instance, but then, what I can do or what I'm, I'm trying to do, what I will be doing today is I will look at some of the main features or the main ideas or concepts that these church fathers, church leaders have advocated, which they have voiced, which they have written, which they have uh, publicized, and then maybe try to see a correlation between those. And then the present attitude or the, the conceptualization that we have at present. So that example I gave earlier about um, that prohibition of a group of male, the Tuai, we call them in my language, uh, the group of uh, gays, so to speak, uh, effeminate men who go around visiting various towns and villages might not necessarily have happened very long in the past because in the long time in the past, Mizo, like many other tribes of the Northeast. We fight village to village. We fight over land. We fight over um, fertile and tillable or cultivable land. So even villages next to each other, they are not always on good terms. So that thing might have happened only when there was certain semblance of um, colon, uh, what may be called Pax Britannica, right? like we speak of the Pax Romana. There was a certain kind of Pax Britannica that happened when <clears throat> the British colonized us. So to a certain extent, they prohibited fights or wars between villages. And so it, in that kind of situation, it, it was easier for people to visit, travel from one village to another. And so it might not have happened very early. It, it might have been only a late 19th century phenomenon. But then the very fact that the colonial administration had to put out res prohibition or restrict restrictions against it, suggests that, okay, maybe there was a certain kind of acceptance or a, a feeling of uh, seeing a feeling that, okay, this is acceptable because they offer a certain service, maybe. Uh, we are only speculating here. But then what we can do as historians is, <laughs> like I said, we can only point out to you what happened and maybe try to interpret what happened in the light of what is happening now and see, okay, maybe we are like this because we, we, our people, our predecessors, our forefathers were like that. And that's why the, the ideas that they have. I hope I have responded to you. Um, so instead of me providing all the answers, sometimes I believe um, uh, this is something which is increasingly encouraged now that the teacher 
answer rather than a lecturer giving lecture, the teacher as a tutor, someone who facilitates <clears throat> a group learning experience. This is something that we are working on now also, which especially, which is very difficult in, a, in an online environment, but it's something that we are trying to focus on rather than the teacher knowing all the answers and responding to each question, maybe uh, if others also uh, can respond to the question, come up with their own responses to the question, and if they have um, particular understanding which, they, which we believe is vital or important, we can also raise that. So once, uh, while I continue, then you can also think about that, and then if there are uh, certain points that you would like to raise with regard to that question, you can also stop me and anyone in the group, any participant can also do that. Teacher, we'll we'll give that room. We'll give room for that that kind of freedom. So the fear or hatred is it insisted by the biblical authors or is it by historians? So naturally, I would say that it's historians. Of course, there are some historians or so-called historians who would interpret or who would rather tweak and twist the data in a certain manner. But as, a, as an academic, not only a historian, not only a student of history, but as an academic, someone who is in academia, we are not supposed to do that. We are supposed to have academic integrity. So you look at the data, you analyze the data, and then, okay, you try to see where it fits, or rather, you try to see how it has impacted the present. So moving on from the Bible or the biblical era, we'll move on to the early church. Um, as it is with historians, it is, there is also the danger of overstating the impact of church leaders. We have to be very clear about that. It's easy to blame Tertullian. It's easy to blame Clement. It's easy to blame John Chrysostom. But then, we also have to understand that they were their impact or their influence might not be as absolute as we would like to believe because churches, Christian communities, wherever we are, we come up with our own local variations or local interpretations of the Christian message, even within one church like, say, the CSI or the CNI, you'll find that there is such a lot of variation within that church where local sentiments and local culture, or likewise with the Presbyterians, where the Presbyterian Church of India, to which I belong. The Mizoram Synod has a particular understanding which might not necessarily be the same as the Kasi Jaintia Presbyterian Synod or any of the other synods in Northeast. So um, there is this danger of overstating the impact of church leaders, but nevertheless, we have to look at what they have to say all right but we have to acknowledge that the early converts developed their own ideas about sex and very often they mix together the teachings of jesus and paul the jewish writings the greek and roman philosophy the non-christian mystery religions and other religious traditions in highly individualistic ways because human beings we are like that the early members of the early church were also would also have been like that, and they were like that. They they developed their own ideas, and they often mixed together many of these traditions and um, teachings as well when coming up or when formulating their ideas, their own ideas about sex. And there was no central authority, even though the bishop of Rome gradually became to uh, claim primacy over the other bishops. But then it was not acknowledged because we in India, especially, we should be very aware of that. The Oriental Orthodox churches, the Oriental Orthodox Christians, basically the Orthodox in Kerala, and then the very variations of it, like the Marthoma uh, and many others who draw from the tradition. They were never comfortable with the idea of having the Pope, the Bishop of Rome as their primate. So they have their own leaders. So the central authority, the idea of a very highly centralized church, which first set up base in Jerusalem and then from there moved on to Rome. That is a very Western, a very limited, a very narrow understanding of it. 
but rather Christianity, like on the day of the Pentecost itself. It spread in all directions. People from all over the empire heard it. People from all over the empire took Christianity to their own religion, to their own regions, and their own regional Christianities grew up in those. So there was no central authority, not only in terms of polity and governance, but even in terms of ideology or theology. Even the bishops were only loosely in control of the beliefs and activities in their dioceses. So what we get was a, a, an enormous range of ideas and practices in the churches. And one of the church leaders will start looking at Clement of Alexandria, who accepted, you know, like I said, we cannot go through all the church fathers, but we'll look at the prominent ones in relation to sexuality and gender identities. So Clement of Alexandria was one of the church fathers who has a very big voice, so to speak, in this matter. He accepted marriage, including sexual activity within marriage as appropriate for Christians. And he thought that husbands and wives should feel affection for one another. And he said, so there is every reason to marry for patriotic reasons, for the succession of children, for the fulfillment of the universe, for the rest of humankind. Marriage finds concord in the experience of pleasure. But the marriage of true lovers of wisdom leads to a concord derived from the logos. So he has sort of um, theologized marriage and even sexual activity. So we can say that he's, he didn't have a, a very largely not visible negative attitude towards sexuality and sexual activity. But then Tertullian is another. He was also married. So he was careful to say that marriages were not prohibited to Christians. But then, the, here is a slight variation here. He regarded virginity as preferable because marriage involved commixture of the flesh. Because once you are married, then naturally you are going to have um, sexual relationships, sexual activity is going to happen there. And that is the essence of fornication, and that is implicit in marriage. That's what he said. So that's why he regarded virginity as preferable. So even though um, he was married, he was having a bit, some negative feelings about it. And he was particularly opposed to second marriages because he termed them as no other than a species of fornication and wrote against them in an open letter to his wife and in several other works. Now, uh, here, what we have to what we also have to consider is that very often uh, church fathers, men, uh, look at sexual activity or rather marriage and union as strongly tied up with this sexual activity. And for them, because of that, marriage is something which is not really the, the ideal state of existence. And then we have another very alarming feature of the early church, which we have to look at. That is the sexualization of women martyrs. Now, if we will read those hagiographies and even the so-called uh, bi biographies of the martyrs, the female martyrs, very often you'll notice that their sexual aspects of their lives often we are often stressed. Whereas no one was really bothered about the sexual um, aspect of those martyrs of the church. Now we all know that at one point there was this very strong tradition in the church of venerating the martyrs. So male, no one was really bothered about their sexual, the sexual aspects of their lives. That's the very fact that they are faithful to Christ in their faith. And then they were unwilling to betray him and they died because of that. But then very often when it comes to descriptions of women's martyrdom, sexual aspects often come in again and again, which is very, very alarming. Because in women, the preservation of their virginity and chastity at all costs is often praised as the ultimate sacrifice. 
So this is uh, the double standard that we often see. It doesn't matter for men, but it really matters for women that they remain virgin or they maintain their virginity or even if they are married people, they maintain their chastity at all costs and even to the extent of dying rather than submitting themselves to the, uh, putting themselves at the mercy of their persecutors. And entertaining, so to, assert, so to speak, of those persecutors. So some hagiographical accounts from this period often describe women who cut their hair and dressed as men for much of their lives and who they often praise them. That, okay, they cut their hair, they dress as men, live like that for the, for the glory of God. I mean, that, that was the idea that was often well, that woman or those women, they cut their hair, they dress as men and live like men for much of their lives. All because they were they did not want to compromise themselves, they did not want to get themselves muddled muddled in the affairs of this world. And so one very prominent martyr of in the church, in the history of the church is Pelagia, Saint Pelagia of Antioch who was a repentant prostitute and cross-dresser. And she was often described originally as bare of head, means bare of head, literally means either a shaven headed or uh, to be uncovered and shortcut like a male, and then and shoulder and limb in form so splendid, so decked that naught could be seen upon her, but gold and pearls and precious stones. So she was highly praised because, and she was sexualized to a certain she later lived for this many years shut up and in solitude as brother Pelagius. So originally she was bare of means she was kind of the way she dresses also was very revealing, so to speak. But then later she lived in solitude and died as brother Pelagius rather than Pelagia. So lived as and died as a monk and a eunuch and spent a lot of time in fasting. So if, uh, if you are interested in reading further on this, there is this book called The Sex Lives of Saints and Erotics of Ancient Hagiography by Virginia Burrus. This is a good study on that aspect of how saints, even in our, when we look at the saints, the saintly figures in the church, sexuality often comes in and we often sexualize, especially the women. So, um, with um, passage of time, there was a certain change. There was a Constantinian shift. Because once Christianity became established as a uh, state religion or a legitimate religion, which had the backing of the state under Constantine. Excuse me, sir. Can I just prom- in between? Yes. Okay, so it's not um, answering a question like that, but uh, it's due to content over time. Uh, if you're continuing, okay. I just want to leave uh, with your permission. I have further earlier participating in this group. Yeah. And if you're continuing the class, let me allow to leave. Okay. Yeah, I'm almost done. So uh, anyhow, we. Yeah. Since you have some other engagement, then please. Leave. But then, yeah, we'll continue on with tomorrow also. And anyhow, there will be a kind of a recap. Anyhow, so you might not miss out too much. I don't have a watch. I've not worn a watch for so many years. And then because I'm looking at the full screen, I don't have my laptop time also. Anyhow, let me see. Oh, we're already crossed 13 minutes. We're supposed to go up to seven. So let me take two more minutes and then we'll wind up. And then um, tomorrow we'll have more time. So the Constantinian shift happened. So the most prominent church fathers became stronger proponents of asceticism. So asceticism became more and more glorified in the church and they embraced these ideals of sexual renunciation, especially developed by the female supporters. Saint Jerome held that by, when a woman chooses, chose virginity, she could move up the gender hierarchy. So as long as a woman is for birth and children, she is as different from man as body is from soul. 
But when she wishes to serve Christ more than the world, then she will cease to be a woman and will be called man. So another very important or rather very infamous person when it comes to sexuality and our lopsided attitude towards it is John Chrysostom. In his fourth homily, he argues that those who have sex with the same sex must do so because they are insane. And of course, he was talking of mostly men because very often men rarely talk of uh, women when it comes to same-sex relationship and so on in the early church. And even now, we are not so much bothered about lesbians, so to speak. But then when it comes to male homosexuals, and we consider that it really uh, is, an, is an aberration. So the men have done an insult to nature itself, and a yet more disgraceful thing than this is it, when even the women seek after these intercourses, what have more shame than men. And so he describes homosexuality as the worst of sins, greater than murder. And he believes that punishment will be found in hell for such transgressors. And women can be guilty of the sin as much as men, he said, homosexuality, of course, as an afterthought. So um, John Chrysostom's legacy is that the male passive partner has effectively renounced his manhood and become a woman. Such an individual deserves to be driven out and stoned. And this, this is why I find, I mentioned at the beginning that we look at misogyny because very often it is the, the belief or the conception that once a male has subscribed to same-sex relations with another male, then he has renounced or he has given up his manhood and he is a, uh, is a disgrace to the male community. That is the understanding that is often there. And so this is the legacy that Chrysostom has left us with. He was particularly described by the homosexual acts. And he wrote more about it, about homosexuality than other church fathers. And his learning, according to Robert H. Allen, his learning and eloquence spans and sums up a large age, a long age of ever growing moral outrage, fear, and loathing of homosexuality. And this is what uh, Robert H. Allen has to do. So we'll stop here today. And um, tomorrow we have another session. And the questions will be shared with you in a Google Doc format. I have prepared it and then I'll work it out with our coordinator Jyoti and so if there are any pressing questions or clarifications that are need that will open time otherwise <coughs> if not, then we'll hand the time back to Jyoti <coughs>